Congressman Alan Grayson would like to uh, conduct a Q&A session right now with all of us. Uh, so if you guys, uh, while we wait for Marianne Williamson to come, if you have any questions, please, here's Alan Grayson. Here I am, the warm-up act for Marianne Williamson. <laughs> I came out here this weekend in order to show my support for her. We've done several events together. We're about to do this one, but no one's quite sure which is going to show up. So I thought it would be fun just to take some questions and try to give some answers. Or if you want, I can ask the questions. You can answer whatever you prefer. It's fine with me either way. So uh, what do you think? Anybody want to talk about anything? Anyone? Yeah, do you enjoy your job? Do I enjoy my job? Yes, I enjoy my job. I lost in 2006, I won in 2008, I lost in 2010, I won in 2012. With that experience, many people in politics have a near-death experience. For me, 2010 was a death experience. So I love it. I wouldn't keep trying to do it if not for the fact that I love it. And frankly, the, the whining that you hear from so many members of Congress, I think, is kind of, really distasteful to me. Um, if you don't like the job, don't run for it. Right, there is this pervasive talking point that you hear over and over again that somehow people can't get anything done in Congress. I passed more amendments last year than any other member of the U.S. House of Representatives. And obviously, if there had been a party line vote on each one, I would have lost each one. We keep finding good ways to pass progressive amendments. I'm not talking about renaming post offices or establishing commissions. Um, there's, there's my um, Senator Rubio moment for you all. I missed it. <laughs> We passed amendments last year to uh, impose a corporate death penalty on companies in chief of government, um, just eliminating them from government contracting entirely. Uh, we passed uh, the only kind of death penalty most people ever support, I think, a corporate death penalty. We passed an amendment last year to increase bilingual housing counseling by 50%. Uh, we passed another amendment to require the uh, Department of Homeland Security is to stop doing racial profiling. And another thing, a number of other things that for one reason or another we were able to get enough support on to get done, uh, acknowledging the fact that the Republicans have more votes than we do. Sometimes, you know, for instance, we'd have an amendment, I, I tell the Democrats honestly that it was an environmental amendment. I tell the Republicans honestly that it was a states' rights amendment. We keep finding these sweet spots where we can get just enough Republican support to get over the goal line. We passed three more this week. This past week we passed three more on the House floor. So it is possible to get things done. And um, what it requires really is more of the desire to get things done than anything else. We have been unilaterally disarming ourselves by convincing ourselves that somehow it's all pointless when that's not true at all. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Um, uh, uh, Marianne Williamson's big issue, number one issue, is money out of politics. Um, where do you stand with that issue, and, and what do you have to say about that? Well, first, Marianne is right. Um, there's no question that uh, the original sin of politics in America is money. Uh, and it completely distorts everything that we do. There's been one academic study after another that has demonstrated that elected officials almost always go with their donors rather than their constituents when there's a division between the two and they have to make up their minds. Um, our lives are often structured around raising money for our election campaigns. The typical member of the House of Representatives spends 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week uh, just raising money. And they do it in what is probably the worst way possible. They call it rich people and beg them for cash. And I'll, I'll tell you that this was a strange experience for me. I had nothing in my background to represent this telemarketing effort that the members of Congress engage in before I ran for Congress. And I thought it was bizarre. I mean, I, first of all, I had nothing to promise these rich people in return for their support, their money. 
And secondly, if I did actually promise them something, it would be a felony. So, it's, and, then, and yet this is what we expect people to do day in and day out. And in fact, it's part of the qualification process to be good at it in order to get as far as actually running for Congress and being nominated for the job. Now, you know, there's less pressure in safe seats. These days, with the Koch brothers dropping two or three or four or five million dollars into individual races over the course of a month, I'm not sure there is a safe seat anymore. Um, but all of us uh, feel that pressure. In, in the last election cycle, the 2012 election cycle, um, there's only one winning candidate, one, um, who raised most of his money from small contributions of $200 or less. Um, that was me. Uh, we have 100,000 contributors to our campaign, and by far the largest list of any Democratic member of the House. And as a result of that, 61% of our money came from the contributions of small donors. The only Senate candidate in the last cycle who was able to accomplish that was Bernie Sanders. The only presidential candidate who was able to accomplish that, God help us all, was Michelle Bachman. <laughs> Uh, and everyone else basically was on the take from multinational corporations and millionaires and billionaires, everyone else. Uh, every single member of the Republican majority, every single member of the Democratic minority except for me. Uh, that's how pervasive this problem has become. And you know, there, Marianne talks about this issue all the time because that is the central problem in our political system today. The central problem in our social system today is, is this gross, uh, enormous, uh, staggering inequality. Um, it affects people's opportunities in life, it affects the general functioning of the economy, um, and it affects people's moral and, as Marion points out, their spiritual lives. But in the political system, the basic problem that we have is the undue influence of cash. Uh, and that problem is not going away anytime soon. We have to do our best to try to alleviate it in the meantime. And there are some signs of hope. Um, you wouldn't necessarily learn this by talking to the DCCC, but in fact, in the last election cycle, more money was raised from small contributors than from large contributors at the DCCC. Um, the, 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 the dollar amounts coming in from small contributors at the DCCC has tripled in the past six years. Uh, the amount that's gone into Republicans actually has been flat. So, uh, in essence, uh, the small donor base of the Democratic Party right now is essentially the dollar equivalent of the Koch brothers. Um, thousands, if not millions, of small donors contributing to the Democratic Party is giving the party enough resources to, to some degree, be able to go toe to toe with the Koch brothers. That's a good development. We'll see if we take we take it further. We do our part. There are members of Congress who did not get a single donation in the last cycle that was less than a $200 cutoff point. Every single dollar that they got was from a big donor. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we can be close enough to people uh, who are small donors to be able to survive in our campaigns and even to thrive. I mean, we outraised almost everybody, um, even though we relied upon small donors to do it. Uh, almost everybody in the Democratic Party, anyway. So it is possible we're trying to develop a new paradigm in our own way through the campaign. Marianne believes in a constitutional amendment. She believes in legal changes to take within the constitutional constraints of the courts and to take things as far as we possibly can. And I support all of those interests. Yes? Um, I've been working for the Social Security Administration for 35 years. One of the major problems that we've had is attrition. We've been told repeatedly, do more with less, do more with less, or to tell people to go to the internet. Now telling people to go to the internet might be, might work for somebody that has internet access, but I'm thinking of people like I talked to last week from somebody in West Virginia who's 20 miles away from a library, and it's about 35 miles away from their contact station, which is now only there once a month. We need more staff in Social Security. Now, I appreciate that in the last budget, we're a finally able to hire, but it still is inadequate. Our offices are still only open a half a day on Wednesdays. And people are just getting really, really frustrated about that. Well, for sure. I mean, the, the, the Republicans have a very clear game plan, which is to destroy 
social services and then complain that social services are no good. Um, I got into uh, quite a lot of controversy uh, a couple of years ago by saying that um, it doesn't make any more sense to put the Republicans in charge of government than to hire an Al-Qaeda member as a pilot. Um, neither one of them wants to land the plane properly. There's just a, if you talk to them on an everyday basis, there's just a lot of truth to that. They literally hate the government. I don't know why they do. I guess they just got poisoned by Fox News and a right-wing propaganda, but, but they don't think in any logical, rational sense. Their, their premise is that the government must be destroyed, and therefore their conclusion is that the government must be destroyed. And they took that to the extreme of shutting down the government last year. Now, unfortunately, um, my party, the Democratic Party, has sort of let them off the hook on that. Uh, their, their poll numbers plunged, plunged uh, during the government shutdown, and now we act as if that never happened. Um, I, I think that we should be running ads in every competitive district around the country uh, with a picture of the Capitol and a sign in front that says, America closed, uh, because that's what they did to the country for that period of time. But what underneath it all is, in fact, a relentless um, unstoppable, implacable attack, not just on public services, but on any conceivable alternative base of power. Um, the reason why the Republicans are against federal workers is because they're unionized. The reason why Republicans are against teachers is because they're unionized. The reason why Republicans are against some transportation workers, like the Teamsters, or the airline pilots, is because they're unionized. And the reason why for instance, they're against the trial lawyers because the trial lawyers support many Democratic candidates. They, they are on a search and destroy mission against anyone who helps Democrats. Um, I am the only member of the House of Representatives uh, to be a member of the AFG. Uh, when I uh, was elected in, in 2009, I had been a member of the AFG, I hate to say this, but in the 70s, um, when I took my first job, uh, working for the Veterans Administration one summer. And I thought I would renew my membership. And and I said to the local chapter head of the AFG, I said, I'd like to join the union. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm a federal employee. I'd like to join the union. And she said, I don't think you could do that. And I said, why not? She said, because nobody's ever done that before. And she checked, and of course, of course, of course, a federal employee like me can join the union. But it's interesting that the Democrats rather than coming to the defense of the people who provide the service you're talking about, whether it's the Social Security or any other part of government, or AFSCME among the state, county, and municipal employees, it's interesting that when the other side attacks, we don't defend, they run away and hide. And that, that's a real problem. That, that's a real problem. Clearly, there are some things that need to be done collectively. And any rational person will agree to that. I'm sorry, but traffic lights are not a government takeover of the roads. Uh, the post office is not a government takeover of the mail. And air traffic control is not a government takeover of the skies. These are things that logically, rationally, must be provided on a collective basis. And the other side will even concede those points. So you and other federal employees are treated like a piñata um, by the other side in the hopes that in doing so they can destroy uh, one of the last remaining uh, places in, in our society which is organized on collective principles by a unit. And that's got to change or we'll all end up with a war all against all. Next question. Yes. Uh, I have a very open question because I don't have an answer in mind, but one of the things we don't hear about on the front pages now is Ukraine. What's your take on the current situation? Well, the immediate past situation was one where I didn't um, really fall into the collective mindset. Um, there was a sort of reflexive impulse to attack Russia uh, over what happened in the Crimea. I didn't buy into that. You know, I, I served the Foreign Affairs Committee. I asked Senator Kerry point blank if there was a free, fair, and open election in the Crimea between remaining part of Ukraine and joining Russia, what would the result be? And he said, without any question, they would join Russia. And to me, that's the end of the story. I mean, 
I don't exist in my job to frustrate the desires of 2 million people 7,000 miles from my district. That's not my purpose. Um, I felt that if that's what the Crimean people wanted, that's fine with me. It seemed like it was none of our business to start with. And I think that these decisions should be made on the basis of um, collective popular will. Um, and I think that over time we're just going to have to get used to the idea that some borders are going to have to be redrawn, hopefully without any violence. We have some very irrational borders in various places around the world. And again, it's not my job or the job of the American people, uh, or for that matter, the white man's burden, to use Roger Titlow's term, uh, just to defend these irrationally drawn borders. So I didn't feel bad about that happening. I was pretty outspoken about that. Interestingly enough, Dana Rohrbacher, your <laughs> South California congressman, uh, agreed with me about that. Uh, Dana has spent, for better or for worse, an awful lot of time over there. Maybe, I don't know, grew up in a gulag or something. I don't really know. <laughs> but, but Dana has enough of a grasp of the situation to understand that that's simply what the people of Crimea wanted. So that's the recent past. Now, at this point, um, we're going through some convulsions in the rest of Ukraine. And the reason why that's happening is because we don't have an agreed upon process to determine what happens when a certain group of people in a certain geographical area feel like they're in the wrong country. And again, this is, this is true in many places around the world, uh, including some places quite nearby. Uh, the Caucasus is, uh, is full of really badly drawn borders. Um, and that's why the Russians have been bogged down in so many parts of the Caucasus over the years. We spent decades um, decolonizing the world. Uh, the um, English basically decolonized in the 50s and 60s, the French in the 60s, the Portuguese in the 70s, the Soviet Union in the 90s. And this is one of the major changes in my lifetime. Now, having been through that, having reached the point where the great debate is whether Nui, uh, a, a supposed country of 2,000 people near New Zealand, should be part of New Zealand or should that be autonomous. Now we're down to the point of arguing about those points. We've done that job of decolonizing. Now we have to look at the boards that exist and decide what to do in a non-violent fashion to allow people who want to move from one country to another to move from one country to another, or people who want to be independent to be independent. That is essentially the challenge of the early 21st century. Nobody's really thinking about that. Yes? How do you feel in an overall sense about fracking? And what do you think in particular about the Keystone XL pipeline? Well, I'm against the pipeline. And I'm against the pipeline in part because we're being treated like fools over it. Um, I mean, whatever the environmental impact, and if, if you look at the aquifer information, it's potentially very dangerous. Uh, we have millions of people who rely upon an aquifer that's very much in danger already that the pipeline is going to go directly over. Uh, that, that aquifer provides 20% of all the irrigation water in the country. So clearly there is an environmental risk, but the part that offends me most is the fact that we set this up in such a way so that the Americans will have no conceivable benefit over this pipeline. Uh, we'll be creating 30 permanent jobs with this pipeline. And it's, the system has been gained to the point where we're not even going to be able to tax the oil as it goes through the pipeline. Um, every other country in the world that has a pipeline passing through it with any significant volume taxes it. But we've created this bizarre situation where um, we're not even going to bother to tax the stuff as it's rolling through the United States. You know, Alaska has been pretty open to natural resource development because Alaskans get a couple of thousand dollars a year from the Alaska Permanent Fund. Um, we're, we're not going to do anything similar to that with regard to the pipeline passing through. So we basically have all the risk, we have none of the benefit. You may ask yourself, why is that the case? And the answer is very simple, it's because most of the refinery capacity that will be used in order to change that into something that can be shipped across the ocean is owned by the Koch brothers. So, and I wrote about this a few, we, a few months ago in Huffington Post, and suddenly the Koch brothers started running ads against me again. But I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the fact is that, that it's, it's, we're being, it's, they're treating us like fools. 
and, and by the patsies, right, uh, right, Uncle Sam is now Uncle Sap. We're, we're being treated like saps, and that really is offensive to me. If there were going to be some effort to uh, alleviate the environmental issues, that's okay, but they're just basically saying, screw it, we want the pipeline, you can all go to hell. And, th and that seems really wrong to me on many different levels. With regard to fracking, it's much the same. I mean, fracking contributes very little, if anything, to the community. Uh, the taxation of oil and gas in general has become a joke. We're, we're still subsidizing oil and gas, even though it's you know, easily one of the largest industries in the entire world. Uh, and we're still subsidizing them through depletion allowances and, and, and so on. So again, it contributes nothing to the community. It leaves the community very much at risk. Uh, if something goes wrong, the aquifer locally is destroyed. If something goes wrong, the water supply uh, might be rendered unusable. If something goes wrong, we could have a massive poisoning that we'll learn about only when people start to die. And again, that seems um, hopelessly one-sided to me. Uh, the reason why we have regulations in general is to try to make sure that companies that, is, that create risk have to pay for that risk. And I don't see that happening at the fracking. Um, uh, you know, the, it happens to be producing temporarily um, a drop in natural gas price in the United States. Uh, of course, immediately commercial interests are jumping in to try to be able to export that natural gas through LNG carriers to other countries so that our gas prices will rise up and up and up again. So it's creating a sort of a temporary economic benefit, but if you look at the depletion rates, they're astronomical. I mean, when you frack, you could be done in three years. And, and, and it's all out, you've taken it all out, and, you're, and you put all sorts of poison into the soil that will never go away. It'll always be there. Um, and and you, you have this, this very short-term immediate benefit, uh, and you've left people the problem that will last hundreds if not thousands of years. So in the current system where basically people do anything they want and leave it to others to pay the price, that's a very dangerous system in both regards.